You are God. And you have the whole world in your hand. There is none like you in the universe. There is none like you anywhere. And so I gotta thank you. I'll never take for granted that you kept me another week. That I woke up this morning and I was in my right mind. I was able to get out of bed. I had food to eat. I had clothes to wear. More importantly, my name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And my destiny is secure in you. And I say thank you. None like you in the universe. None like you anywhere. So we honor you and magnify you and praise you. We ask today that you would take complete control of our hearts and our minds and reveal the fresh word unto us that we'll be preaching today. Then we want to be able to process it in our minds, live it out in our lives so that you might receive the glory and the honor. Lord, I want to take a moment and just pray for our nation. Pray for the leaders of our nation. I want to take a moment and pray for the countries of the world that you would move in a mighty way and change things. Because I believe in prayer and I believe that you can do mighty things. And so we pray to you today. Now take complete control of everything that goes on in this house. Whatever is accomplished, you'll say yes to your will. In the marvelous, mighty, matchless name of Jesus, I'm looking for folks who are not ashamed to say praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm, I'm looking for folks who are not ashamed to say praise God. Praise God. And amen. Go ahead and be seated in God's house. I'm glad you're here today. Is there anything more central to Christianity than the cross? Yet the cross has been turned into a piece of jewelry. If you are wearing a cross today, please don't hide it and don't feel condemned. You didn't turn the cross into jewelry. The culture did that. But it is shocking. Consider for a moment that the French would turn the instrument of torture during their revolution, a guillotine, into a piece of jewelry that would certainly seem incongruous and inappropriate. Nevertheless, one of the cruelest instruments of human torture, the cross, has been turned into jewelry. As I read The Scandalous God, The Use and Abuse of the Cross by Vitor Westhill, and the cross and human transformation, Paul's apocalyptic word in 1 Corinthians by Alexandra R. Brown. I became more and more aware of the scandal of the cross. What is the scandal of the cross? We get a glimpse of that scandal in one of the early New Testament writings. Do not jump up and down. I'll tell you when you can get up because I'm going to be hitting a number of scriptures. Galatians 5 and 11. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Here Paul's Judaic enemies accused him of preaching circumcision, trying to ruin his reputation with Christians. And Paul defends himself by saying, if I'm still preaching the circumcision, then why am I still being persecuted for preaching the gospel? He goes on to make a powerful statement. If I'm preaching the circumcision, then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. The phrase stumbling block. In the Greek is the word scandalon. According to the New American Standard Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, it means a stick or a bait or a trap, generally a snare, a stumbling block, an offense. We get the word scandal from it. Paul touches on the scandal again in an extended teaching of the cross in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, the first and second chapter. But we'll lift up some verses just for our uh, consideration before we begin and before we get that far, 1 Corinthians 1, For indeed, Jesus asked for signs, and Greeks searched for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. May the Lord have a blessing of the reading of his holy word. 
Spirit of God. Although we're going to save the exposition of that verse for later on, let's just touch on Paul's use of the phrase stumbling block. Judeans asked for signs, but Paul preached Christ crucified was a stumbling block to the Judean. It tripped them up. Jesus did not provide the signs that they were seeking, but rather it offered grace free of charge. They were offended by the message. The cross not only saves, but it scandalizes. That's not something we preach. It's not something we hear. So we're in trouble. Touch somebody and say, he's at it again. And we just got through with talking about Sunday worship to Monday work, and that was tough enough. But now we're going to talk about the cross, not its saving perspective, not just what it does in terms of representing the love of Jesus Christ, but the scandalization of the things that are captured in the cross, the mystery of the cross. While here, let's touch on two other uses of the Greek word scandalon real quick. Romans 9 and 30. What shall we say then? But Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, the scandalon. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. First Peter 2 and 4, let the scripture speak to you a little bit and coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stone are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. The precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. May the Lord add another blessing to the reading of his holy word. The cross was a scandal to the Judeans. Jesus' message on the cross was a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. It was uh, the teaching that messed the folks up. Now, we think the cross is always saving folks, and praise God, it is the ultimate and one of the ultimate implements of salvation, but the cross can turn people away. Don't you know some folks, when you start talking about Jesus, give you the hand in the face? They don't want to hear it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to interact around it because it is a stumbling block. For us, it's more foolishness. We'll talk about later on when we get to that verse. But Rene Noel Theophile Girard was a French historian, literary critic, philosopher of the social science whose work belongs to the tradition of anthropological philosophy. He's the world's premier thinker about the role of violence in cultural origins and about the Bible's illumination of those origins. He touches on the use of the word scandalon in a book he wrote called The Scapegoat. And he writes, and I quote, derived from scadzane, which means to limp. Scandalon de designates the obstacle that both attracts and repels at the same time. The initial encounter with the stumbling block is so fascinating that one must always return to it, and each return becomes more fascinating. The Judeans were, all, were trapped by the message of the cross in that the more they considered it, the more it drew them, and the more it drew them, the more it repelled them. It's a love-hate relationship. I think y'all, some of y'all know something about that, don't you? There's another word very similar to it, the scandalon that Gerard touches on in his book, Violence and the Sacred. He writes, it is not surprising that the word pharmakon, from which we get our word pharmacy in classical Greek, means both a poison and an antidote for poison, both sickness and a cure. In a short, any substance capable of perpetrating a very good or a very bad action according to the circumstances and the dosage. The pharmacon is thus a magic drug, a volatile elixir, whose administration has best be left by ordinary men in the hands of those who enjoy special knowledge and exceptional powers. Priests, magicians, shamans, doctors, 
and so on. End of quote. The cross and its message is a pharmacon. It's a poison and an antidote to poison at the same time. It's a sickness and a cure for sickness at the same time. We'll see that the cross is poison and sickness to the Judeans, but for those of us who are believing in Jesus Christ, it is the antidote to poison and a cure for sickness for those of us who are being saved. Somebody going to catch on here in a minute that need to understand that for people who are unsaved, the cross will drive you while it's drawing you. But for those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God under salvation which sets us free. You got to understand that for one people, one side is darkness to the other side is light. For one, it's poison to the other, it's the antidote. To one, it's sickness to the other, it's cure. I'm talking about the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me just stop for a minute and, 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 and situate myself this morning because I've been preaching about the... Uh, um, t uh, the Sunday worship becoming Monday and, and connecting to Monday work and talking very conversationally about these issues and moving down into your lives and trying to deal with that. But now I'm talking about Jesus and what he's done for me and therefore I have a tendency to kind of get kind of excited and jacked up because I'm talking about the one who saved me and died on Calvary that I might be free. And I can't talk about this like I'm just talking about uh, going to Wendy's. Uh, Jesus died on Calvary that I might be set free and because of what he did for me I've got to praise him So, so I'm going to be a treacher in this series. Uh, the last series, I was much more low-key. In this series, I will bounce back and forth between teaching and preaching. So I will be the treacher in this series and try to work my way through it. Because let me, bow, let me come down for a minute and deal with the fact of what I need to be talking about to get set up for where I'm going to go. The pharmacon shall yield many paradoxes, many antitheses, many opposites. The antitheses are based on the contradistinction of the wisdom of God versus worldly wisdom. And what we're going to do is we're working our way to 1 Corinthians, the first and the second chapter, because I want to preach through those. In the last sermon series, it was topical and conversational and anecdotal. This is going to be expositional through these particular verses as we go verse by verse to see what God's got to say to us. And in these verses, we see that Paul is setting up certain contraries, certain opposites. We see folly. I'm just going to go through what it says. I'm in my introduction. Touch somebody. Say, I mean, he's in his introduction. Give him a little time, please. Folly versus the power of God. Perishing versus the ones who are being saved. The wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. Because some of y'all don't understand that the things of God you cannot get because you are smart. Oh, I'm, I'm in trouble already. People thinking, I, I'm smart. I can read it and I can get, you can read it, but you can't get the truth of it. You, you might get some facts, but you can't get the truth. The truth only comes through the power of the Holy Ghost and the revelatory power of God. The wisdom of the world does not line up with the wisdom of God. And we'll talk about the wisdom of the world versus the folly of the gospel, of the charisma, of, of the caruso, of, the, of pre, the proclamation of the gospel that is foolish to most people to come to a church like today and sit up in here and, and let some man talk to you um, and preach and proclaim to you the word of God. But it is the power of God unto salvation to those who are being saved. To the world, it's foolishness. Why even go? Why even do that? But when God takes something... His wisdom is wiser than the wisdom of man. We'll talk about how Jews seek sign, but to those of us, we are called. We'll talk about the Greeks, how they seek wisdom, uh, but, but Christ is the wisdom of God. We'll talk about the foolishness of God versus the wisdom of human beings. We'll talk about, these are all antitheses that come up in the first and second chapter of first, and, of first Corinthians. We'll talk about the weakness of God versus the strength of human beings. We'll talk about being wise by human standard, but foolish when you're chosen by God. We'll talk about powerful and strong when we consider others weak by who are chosen by God. We'll talk about those who are no, nobly born against those who are lowly and despised. We'll 
talk about things that are versus things that are not. We'll talk about the proclamation of lofty words of wisdom when Paul said, I came to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We'll talk about plausible words of wisdom and Paul's speech and preaching. We'll talk about plausible words of wisdom versus the demonstration of the pneuma and the dynamis of the dynamic power of God. We'll talk about human wisdom versus power of God. We'll talk about the contraries of what's set up so that we might see that the wisdom and the preaching of the cross is both light to some and darkness to other, health to some and messed up stuff to other, that it is a cure to some while it's a poison to other, that the cross is a mystery. And nobody has talked to us about the mystery. We only talking about that which can be plainly seen. We're going to talk a little bit about the anthropology of the cross, not just the theology of the cross. The theology of the cross is that God sent Jesus to die so that he might, die. well, excuse me, I that's the old theology. I forgot that. That's what y'all believe. God sent Jesus to destroy the devil. And he died because he submitted himself to the process. Are y'all, anybody still here? That's what's going on. That's what we see happening. And as we talk about that and those kind of things that are going on, we're going to move in and begin to look at the mystery, the anthropology of the cross. The anthropology of the cross is that God wanted us to see how violent people were. Please don't look at anybody right now. Because I know somebody came right across your mind, didn't they? But you should be looking at yourself. You should be looking at you. Because it's about us and us looking at ourselves. The cross is the pivot between the ages. It reveals new insight about the inbreaking reign of God, but it confuses many because of the conventional perspective of the world versus the transformed perspective of the cross. In the cross, from the perspective of the world, you have a symbol of suffering. You have a symbol of weakness. You have a symbol of folly. You have a symbol of death. But from the perspective of the new creation, you have the transforming power and symbol of the power and the life of God. So Paul explores these things in several places, but we're going to work through 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 2. The first letter of Paul to the Corinthians seems to be answering questions that they asked. And then the letter had an abundance, this church had an abundance of gifts but they were besieged by division and infighting. Kind of sounds like the house of the Lord, don't it? Having a lot of gifts don't mean that you're not violent. <laughs> Having a lot of gifts doesn't mean that you are right. But we need to figure out how to get God in them gifts. The scholars who interpret the New American Standard have summarized verses 1 through 17 as an appeal to unity. If there's anything we need today, we need unity. Coming to church, speaking in tongues, falling out, having all the gifts, and then full of hell does not represent God does not represent God talking about one another while, while I just got through talking to God does not represent God and so I want to work my way if you will allow me to 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 the scandal of the cross but I, I refuse to just jump there so I'm going to work expositionally and, and exegetically through 1 Corinthians, the first and second chapters, and try to work my way to where I want to go. Can, can y'all let me do that, please? Well, let's, let's go there then, the 1 Corinthians 1. Now you can stand up if you want to, and we'll read an extended passage. 1 Corinthians 1, 1. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord 
and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, was also, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May the Lord have the blessing of the reading of his holy word. Word of God, go ahead and be seated. Let's work through it little by little, verse by verse. Now, just in case you don't know and you're looking for where I'm preaching from, where am I preaching from? First Corinthians, you can just keep your head down and just walk with me through First Corinthians. I'm getting ready to go verse by verse. Paul begins the letter with an introduction of himself. He begins with his Christian name, Paul. He gives us the basis of his existence. He is called to be an apostle of Jesus the Christ through the will of God. An apostle is one who is set on a mission. I don't want to stop here, but I want to ask the general question. Do you have a mission or are you just living life? You ought to have a mission that is given to you by God Almighty. Next, Paul mentions his companion Sosthenes. He may be the same Sosthenes who took a beating for Paul in Acts 18 and 17. Paul usually ministered with companions, and the nature of the church is a body or community. I ask the second question. Do you have any companions who are willing to take a beating for you? I move forward. Paul moves on from his customary salutation to address the church. He addresses the church, which is at Corinth. The church is comprised of those who have been sanctified, set apart in the Messiah, Jesus. The church members are saints by calling who are all in every place called on the name of our Lord and Jesus the Christ. He is the Lord of the Corinthians and Paul and of his companions. In short, he's trying to get them to understand in the early church that God that Jesus is God and he's equal to the Father we are saints even though we have sin in our lives we are called by the name that designates our calling we are evangelicals we come from the world of being saved sinners and that that title causes us to work on the sin part and not on the saved part but he says here you're not a sinner you're a saint you've been called by God and set apart and what you are is that he has set you apart from any other thing under himself and I'm going to call you a saint so you can live up to your calling and to what you've been called that you're not trying to live some saved sinner life forget the sinner part he saved you and set you apart that you might be able to live in the way that he wants you to live so he moves from his customary salutation and he proclaims grace and favor and peace to the Corinthians. We need to get some new salutations instead of just, what's up? We're going to figure out, Paul says, grace to you and favor to you in the name of God. What would happen all over this city if people start hearing us greet one another in the marketplace at Macy's? Grace unto you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're going to want to know what's going on, what's happening. Who are these people? What are they talking about? This is the early in the history. Once again, he's establishing the fact that Jesus is also God. He's the Messiah. The gospel didn't start with the death of Jesus Christ. The gospel didn't start when he was born on this earth. The gospel didn't start. He said, when did it start? The gospel goes all the way back to the beginning. In the Genesis, he said, he will bruise you on the heel, but you will crush his head. That when Jesus came, he fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament all the way up into the New Testament that the plan of God did not begin in Matthew 1 and 1 but the plan of God began before the foundation of the world and God had a plan and began to work that plan in order that you might be saved today forgive me I'm getting a little excited because he saved me when I was messed up and didn't know where I was going he came and found me pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on a rock, establish my going. Where would I be if it wasn't for Jesus Christ today? 
Hallelujah. All right, calm down, calm down, calm down. We're just getting into it. Paul gives thanks to God for the Corinthians and the grace of God that was given to them in the Messiah, in Jesus. Every day that you get up, every day of your life, you ought to give thanks to God for the grace of God in your life, for the favor of God in your life. He didn't have to do it, but he does. Every day you get up, you ought to praise God and say thank you for another day. Thank you for getting me up this morning. Thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you. I'm in my right mind. Every day you get up, you ought to thank God for what he's done for you. It ought to take you back, take me back to the church of God in Christ. Just another day that the Lord has kept me. Oh, I, I felt that right there. I, I, just another day. Where would I be if it wasn't for the fact that he kept me? Paul then, Paul then, I'm going to treat you today, and I'm going back and forth, okay? Paul then uses the demonstrative pronoun, that, to name the benefits of the grace and the favor of God. First, they have been enriched or made rich in Christ. The richness manifests itself in all speech. The Greek word is logos, and perhaps Paul's thinking about the richness of the word of God. The Corinthians were rich in all knowledge. We can intuit that Paul is referring to the word of God, for in the next words he says, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. That testimony concerning Christ is a different way of talking uh, about the gospel, the words of Christ. And in this particular verses, Paul bounces back and forth between the euangelion, between the pronunciation of the good news, between the word of the gospel and the charisma, the, the caruso, the proclamation of the gospel. He jumps back and forth because he's dealing with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus Christ and the message of the cross and the proclamation of the cross because it's at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith that I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day at the cross. The cross is what makes the difference. I, I'm, I'm glad that we're connecting Sunday worship to Monday work, but I don't want you to forget about the cross because it's at the cross that things get straightened out. It's at the cross that my vision becomes clear. It's at the cross that power is given to me. It's at the cross that things uh, go the way God wants them to go. At the cross! And so, the result of the favor and the enrichment is that they were not lacking in any gift. And they were eagerly awaiting the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I'm glad. I want you to know. I want to testify. I want to proclaim. You're not lacking any gift you need to live like God wants you to live. Everything you need, he's already given to you. You ought to just praise him about that right now. Everything I need to be a Christian, he's already given it to me. Oh, I wish I had time. I, I, I would stay there. But number two, they were eagerly awaiting for him to return. They were not waiting for the next sale uh, at Burger King. They were not waiting uh, for their income tax check. They were waiting for Jesus, who is soon to return. They say, he's coming back again, and I'm waiting. I got my eyes on the sky. I'm waiting, and I'm in anticipation that he might return. They're waiting on the revelation. I got to teach for a moment. The word revelation is an interesting word. It is the word apocalypsis. We get the English word apocalyptic from it. Paul's whole teaching is apocalyptic. Alexandra R. Brown writes in The Cross and Human Transformation, no term is more central to our concern nor more elusive than apocalyptic. While the word is satisfactorily translated as an unveiling or a revelation, the term is complicated. It's complicated by historical, literal, and theological matters that extend well beyond the lexical or dictionary meaning. So somebody said, let, let him talk, would you? Just let him talk. Just let, him, let him talk. So, so, so the book describes in the Bible, the last book of the Bible, it's called, and you don't even know it, the Apocalypsis. It, it's called the, 
the revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, and it records the unveiling of the end times. In addition, a specific literary genre has developed with this name, which is first recognized in pre-Christian texts of the Second Temple Judaism, and beginning with the book of Daniel, and then adopted by other writers, all the way up to most notably the book of the Revelation. Ah, you're lost. In short, books like Daniel and Revelation are apocalyptic literature. He said, what, what do that mean, Bishop? What do that mean? Well, let me, if you just stay here, I would have, try to help you to understand. That, that the scholar Richard Sturm, in his essay defining the word apocalyptic, said that there are three characteristics of apocalyptic literature. Number one, two, the idea of two eons or immeasurably long periods of time. Number two, the embattled sovereignty of God over time and history. Number three, the revelation of an, imme an imminent eschaton or an end time. If you missed that, bump, bump your neighbor said, I missed all of that. I, I just, I didn't get it. What is he talking about? Somebody help me. Uh, is this going to help me connect Sunday worship to Monday work? I'm lost. Don't worry, let me get you out. If you missed all of that, I'm simply saying and trying to point out, Paul is an apocalyptic thinker. He's an apocalyptic writer. The word of the cross is an apocalyptic revelation, and there are three characteristics. Number one, the word of the cross is about two eons, two immeasurably long periods of time. The first one begins with Adam's creation, and when Adam was created, a period of time began, and a, a, a dispensation of time began. But when Jesus came, a whole new creation of time began. When Jesus stepped into reality uh, from eternity into reality, something changed. The kingdom of God, even though it had not yet fully come, was already breaking into the present dispensation. That even though I don't have yet what I'm going to have over there, it already has begun over here. That even though I wait for something that is coming that there's been an inbreaking of the kingdom into my present situation so that even though I'm not there yet forgiveness has already started that even though I'm not there yet freedom has already begun even though I'm not there yet God has done something already that I'm beginning to spin experience right now that God has begun a deliverance in my life right now yes he's doing it right now now the saints were where I came from like to talk about over there it'll be no more dying no more crying over there be no more trouble no more uh, strife over there but the problem was I don't live over there I live right here so I need to know what's happening right here and right here I got some problems going on Right here, I got some issues that are happening. Right here, I got some struggles that are going on. But praise God that Jesus stepped from in eternity in the time. And when he did, the inbreaking of the kingdom began. And he began to break into my situation. He began to break into my circumstances. He began to step into my situation and work some stuff out right now. I may not get it all right now. I won't get it to over there, but he broke into it right now. He's already doing it. He's already working it out. He's already had the power going on. He's already moving down into the detail of what's going on. Somebody praise God that he's already in your situation. He's already anticipated where you're going. He's already opened the door before you get there. He's already working. He's already working it out right now. All right, all right. I, I, I'm the treacher today. I'm the treacher. I'm moving back and forth. You'll be able to shout some more. Don't worry. This is the shouting series. The first is the word of the cross is about two eons of immeasurable period. Number two, when we talk about the apocalyptic, the, the word of the cross is about the embattled sovereignty of God over time and history. There is a battle going on, and the devil is trying to take away God's power and God's sovereignty. But who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Who is the king of glory? The Lord high 
and mighty and lifted up. But you got confused there because it's a battle going on, but God doesn't win by, by, by power or, or by secular power or by human power. He wins by the word of God that comes from him like a two-edged sword. He wins by the victory of laying down his life. He wins by being defeated on Cal up I, I can't hear nobody right now by getting crucified it looked like a defeat but it wasn't a defeat he wins by the mystery of the cross he wins by the scandal of the cross and you win by the word of your testimony and by the blood of Jesus Christ you don't win by slapping somebody upside the head you win when you proclaim the word and you win when you walk in the blood you win when you apply the stuff that God had because the wisdom of God is wiser than the wisdom of men and the power of God is greater than the power of men when God steps in your life and in your situation with the power of the kingdom and the power of the cross there's gonna be a deliverance in your situation soon I wish you would get ready right now because God is up to something in your situation right now. All right. Commercial, commercial, commercial break. Commercial break. It's too exciting in here. Commercial break. Call all your friends, nephews, in laws, outlaws live-ins. Tell them, Bishop Joy's got a preaching series right now. That's what you've been waiting on. You didn't want to connect Sunday worship to Monday work. So you need to come to church right now. You've been wanting to shout, this is your chance. The cross is apocalyptic. The word of the cross, I said it's apocalyptic. And the word of the cross, apocalyptic, means there are two eons of time. That there is an embattled sovereignty of God. And number three, the word of the cross is about the revelation of the imminent coming of the end time in Jesus Christ. He's soon to come. He's soon to come. Forgive me for a moment uh, as I just move into the psychology of it for a moment and, and just deal with the fact that when we say he's soon to come, we've been saying that for 2,000 years. How, how is he soon to come? I, I just want to answer the question because he's been 2,000 years, we'd be saying he, he's soon to come. That ain't soon to me. Soon is in a, in a day or two, a couple hours, uh, not 2,000 years. The problem is we don't understand the dispensations of grace and law. We don't understand. Perhaps we have misinterpreted the end time as simply a point in time rather than a dispensation of time that was, that was born and came into being through the birth, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The end time began when Jesus was born and stepped from eternity into time. The end time began. You say, well, when is it going to be done? I don't know. All I know is is that as long as I got Jesus, I'm standing in the end time. I'm a part of the end of time. And the end of time is not in the secular time, but it's in him because in him all time is wrapped up. In him all time is represented. In him. Hallelujah. All right, back to where I left, left off. I have two more shouting points, and then I could go. These are shouting points here. I'm sorry. The other series was more influential teaching points. This is shouting points. The Corinthians were eagerly waiting for the revelation of Jesus the Christ, who would confirm and strengthen them to the end. He would confirm them as unblameable under the day of the Lord Jesus the Christ. In our task of moving towards the scandal of the cross, I don't want you to get lost here today, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get to the scandal of the cross. 
But I refuse to jump there. I want to deal exegetically, expositionally with the text. He would, uh, as, he, as we move, we have come to a word of encouragement. God says, I'm going to confirm and strengthen you unto the end. Whatever, whenever that is, you don't have to worry. There is an assurance that I am confirming you and I am strengthening you unto the end. I thought somebody would shout off of that. Maybe you ought to just tell a couple people, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. He's working it unto the end. It looks like sometimes I'm not going to make it. It looks like sometimes the devil has won. It looks like sometimes that it's all over. But when I look back, I want you to know that I read the end of the book and we win. I said I read the end of the book and we win. He said I will confirm you and I will strengthen you until the end. Whether the end is nuclear holocaust or the end is death. Whatever the end's going to be, God said, I got your back. You can't mess up. You might fall on board, but you can't fall overboard. I'm working with you. I'm strengthening you. I'm lifting you. I'm giving you everything you need. I'm just like giving you the power. I'm pushing you up. I'm right there behind you. Somebody. Praise God for just a little while. Praise him for just a little while. Praise him for just a little bit. One more. One more. About to preach myself out here. Paul ends the greeting with a statement. God is faithful. He's faithful through whom the Corinthians were called into fellowship, koinonia, with the Son, Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord, who is also God. God Another word of encouragement is faithful. God is trustworthy. The devil's going to whisper in your ear and tell you if he was faithful, then why are you looking like you look? If he's faithful, then why are you stuck where you stuck? If he's faithful, then what's wrong with your experience? But I got a word for you right here. God is faithful, trustworthy. What he said, he's going to do. The problem is that you are trying to hold him accountable for something he didn't say. He didn't tell you you was getting a new car in 2018. He didn't tell you who was going to work everything out like you wanted it. But he promised to be faithful. There is no weapon that's formed against you that's going to be able to ultimately prosper. I, Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all creation, I am your God, and I will make sure that I am faithful to you. When you're walking and it looks like there's nobody there, I'm there with you to the end of the age. When it looks like the devil is winning, I'm still standing there faithful. When everybody has left you and walked away, I'm still there faithful. Faithful is the Lord God Almighty. The devil wants us to believe that God is not faithful. He told Eve, if he's so faithful, why won't he let you eat off that tree? If he's so faithful, he told you, then why won't he give you a husband? 
If he's so faithful, then why don't you have a job? If he's so faithful, then why this and why that? It's the devil trying to insinuate that God is not a faithful God. Even though he's faithful enough to let the devil still exist in his treachery. The only way the devil could even talk to you is that God extends his faithfulness. I wish I had some help up in here. He could just say, ah, oh, that would be the end of that. But because of the God that he is, he extends dispensation so that people and others can do what they do so one day he can wrap it all up. He's got a plan, but in the meantime, I just want to let you know he's faithful. I said he's faithful. I can testify that there have been many times in my life when I thought that God was not there, only to move and pull back the curtain and say, there he is right there. I thought he wasn't there, only to turn the page of my experience and find out there he is right there. I thought he wasn't there, only to peek behind my tribulation and find out that he was there all the time. I thought he wasn't there, but I have figured it out that over and over again, he was there hidden in plain sight. I thought he wasn't there, but he was standing right there. And when the time became right, he would manifest himself and I would see him in his glory and say, oh, that was you all along. It was you who opened the door. It was you who worked it out. It was you who was standing behind me. It was you. Hallelujah. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Remember, we are exploring the opening of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians so that we may work our way to an exposition of the scandal of the cross. Now is a day of salvation. Come to Jesus now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you do not know this Jesus, I want you to know him. He died on Calvary for you. Where would you be if Jesus hadn't loved you? And so if you are unsaved today, he wants, he wants to save you. He is faithful. And all you need to do is just say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life, save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. These are altar workers standing here. They'd love to pray with you. because you'll be making a public statement that I've trusted in Jesus. All around me, I'm, I'm pushing people to read some of the books that I'm reading, and one of the pastors have started to read it. He called me up, messed up. It's good to get messed up. So we can find out what we believe. And he said, Bishop, you know, I know you've always preached hell. I said, no, I've never preached that. I'm not a hell, fire, and brimstone preacher. Do you believe that it's a hell? Do you? Yeah, I believe that. But I don't believe Jesus was constantly talking about hells to unsaved people. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, he did talk about hell, but mostly it was to the church people. He said, now you in danger of hell fire the way you acting, but not to sinners. And so 
we were talking a little bit about that because I want to say if you prayed that prayer, it's between you and God. I have not truncated the gospel down into just a method of salvation. You don't have to walk down the aisle. You don't have to do nothing. You don't have to come down here. All you need to do in your heart is trust God. And he is faithful. He will save you. Coming down the aisle, doing all those other things, those are human things that we do to affirm that we have received the gift that God has given to us. But salvation is a gift. All you need to do is trust God. You need a church home? We give you that opportunity. The rest of us, I think we ought to pray at the beginning of this series. Lord, reveal to me the scandal of the cross so I can thank you for all that you've done for